Hi everyone, my name is Sarah White. I am Operations Director at St. John's Church Foundation here at historic St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. John Moss. John is an education staff member at the soon to be open National Museum of the US Army at Fort Belvoir. Dr. Moss received a PhD in early American history at The Ohio State University. He is the author of several books on early US military history, including North Carolina and the French and Indian War, Defending a New Nation, George Washington's Virginia, and the book from 2015 that we're going to talk about today, which is The Road to Yorktown. Jefferson, Lafayette, and the British Invasion of Virginia. Welcome, Dr. Moss. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Yes, thank you so much. So we'll just start with this question. Okay. Why Virginia? Why now? The, the Revolutionary War battles had been fought uh, mostly other places since 1776. There hadn't been much action in Virginia by 1779. Portsmouth had been taken by the British, and then now in 1780, 81, there was a little action coming. We had Benedict Arnold in Virginia, in Richmond, in January of 1781, and later that spring, all of it seems to coordinate here in Virginia. Can we just set the stage and tell us why Virginia, why now? Okay, well, there were two uh, lines of effort that the British were making in the Chesapeake region in Virginia. The first was a series of raids uh, that was led by General Phillips, who raided up and down the James River and part into Richmond, the Richmond area, uh, Petersburg, Osborne's Landing, uh, places like that along the, along the James River between, say, uh, Petersburg down to the Williamsburg area. And they were trying to destroy a lot of military supplies, but also tobacco. And tobacco was really Virginia's currency. So they knew that if they destroyed tobacco, then Virginia wouldn't be able to pay for military supplies in the West Indies. But that was a fairly small force that had naval assets as well. But the large force that entered Virginia in 1781 was from the Carolinas. Uh, the British invaded South Carolina uh, and took Charleston in May of 1780, and uh, their campaign into North Carolina uh, included a lot of the battles that most folks who read about the South and the Revolution are familiar with. Camden, Kings Mountain, Cowpens, and Guilford Courthouse. And Guilford Courthouse is in the central part of North Carolina. But by that time, the British had suffered a lot of casualties, a big percentage of their force, over 25%, uh, had been, were casualties. They had not been supplied in months because really the only way to supply them while they were in the Carolina backcountry was from Charleston. That's a long way overland, susceptible to raids and lack of shipping, lack of horses, lack of wagons. So after Cornwallis won a very costly Pyrrhic victory at Guilford Courthouse, he really only had one option, which was to uh, retire or retreat to the coast. So he marched his army down the Cape Fear River uh, through by way of what later became Fayetteville and uh, arrived at Wilmington, North Carolina uh, on the Cape Fear near the coast in early April. And at that point he decided that until basically until Virginia is subdued, the war in the Carolinas could never be won. And the reason for that is Virginia was the logistical hub of the effort of, on the part of the Americans in the Carolinas. So all the supplies that were going from Virginia, all the men being recruited, trained, armed, equipped, that logistical tail went from Virginia down into the Carolinas. And the key depot being at Chesterfield Courthouse um, and other depots included uh, Point of Fork, which is in, uh, which is where the Rivanna River meets the James River in Flavanna and Albemarle County, Prince Edward County, and Fredericksburg. So 
Cornwallis, who was not in communication with his superior very much, that was Sir Henry Clinton in New York City, Cornwallis sent a letter to him from Wilmington in late April saying, well, I think we need to crush Virginia in order to win the war in the South. Please let me know whatever your summer campaign objectives are. Well, he marched the army off from Wilmington before he ever got a response to that letter. So he had made his mind up and they marched into Virginia and finally reached, uh, reached Petersburg in uh, about May 12th and met Phillips's force in Petersburg. But by that time, Phillips had already died of a fever. Okay, and that is May 12th, 1781. 1781. Right, so Cornwallis now is in Petersburg. And meanwhile, Lafayette has been sent from where? By Washington to Virginia to defend Virginia from this impending British attack? That's correct. So George Washington, the main Continental Army up north, including Lafayette, uh, they were in what's called the Hudson Highlands, which was the area of high ground north of New York City uh, toward West Point. And that was uh, considered to be a safe area, but also strategic because the, the Hudson River could be uh, crossed there by ferry. And so supplies could go from New England to the Mid-Atlantic and, and the other way around also. But once, for, once it became obvious that Cornwallis uh, was going to turn toward Virginia, and Phillips's raids had really wreaked a lot of havoc along the James River. Washington decided to send Lafayette with 1,000 light infantrymen from uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and uh, a few of the other northern states on a long trip uh, down to Virginia to help create a core of a defense for Virginia augmented by militia troops. So that, that force, Lafayette and his light infantrymen, they uh, came by way of the head of the Chesapeake, then Annapolis, overland to Alexandria, and then down through what's Dumfries, Fredericksburg, Bowling Green, Hanover Courthouse, and then reached Richmond at the end of April. So that was gonna be the core of the defenses for Virginia. And interestingly, Lafayette was in his early 20s. This was his first major independent command. And the, what's interesting is George Washington selected him to defend Washington's native state. So it gives you a little bit of, of insight into how Washington regarded Lafayette, even though he was so young. Right, so had Lafayette proven himself in some other battle or was there no one else? Why did Washington trust him so much? Uh, for two reasons, I believe. First, he was involved in some smaller campaigns, but not with any clear cut victory, but he, but he served capably at Monmouth. He was wounded at Brandywine in 1778. But Washington knew that he needed someone that was representing the American forces of Virginia who could act as a liaison with the French, whom he had started to get word even that early that there was a possibility of some kind of coordination with French naval forces. So I think that's, that's why he, he, he picked Lafayette for that role. So Lafayette is in, so he's made it to Richmond. Correct. And that was April. He meets with Jefferson, and then he goes and his 1,000 Continentals are parked at Rocket's Landing area here in Richmond. Um, they're sort of waiting. So we've got Cornwallis on the south of the river. We've got Lafayette on the north. Lafayette is... Is he at this point waiting for his backup troops? Like a thousand men isn't, isn't very many against the British. Well, to start from your first question, the American forces uh, did occupy ground from the Rockets area, uh, also toward what, where the modern capital is now on that kind of those heights. And they were actually able to block some preliminary British movements 
uh, to try to cross the river. Lafayette had about a thousand men, uh, not including militia, and Cornwallis had roughly 5,000 men. Uh, some of the men that, that he brought with him and that he had met up with Phillips, he sent back to Portsmouth to act as the garrison for Portsmouth. So Cornwallis's mission was to destroy Virginia's logistical ability to, to maintain the war. So that's what he was going to do. And Lafayette's role was to hopefully prevent Cornwallis from doing that, or at least to, to limit the damage as well as he could. Also expected was a contingent uh, a detachment of Pennsylvanians in a brigade led by Brigadier General Anthony Wayne. And they were expected to come down early in the year to, to also support the Virginia efforts to defend itself. The problem was that on January 1st, 1781, the Pennsylvania line mutinied over dates of service and pay. And by the time Continental officers uh, up at York, Pennsylvania, where the brigade was stationed, by the time they were able to sort out the enlistment dates and the bounties and the bonuses and the dismissals, Wayne got a very late start. So he didn't really start for Virginia until May. And the whole time that Lafayette was trying to maneuver and defend Virginia, he was kind of looking over his shoulder to the north, waiting for Anthony Wayne to come down. So he's waiting, he's waiting for these reinforcements, basically. Correct. He also, at this time, has been petitioning or complaining, writing letters about how he can't get horses and how the British are taking all the horses from the countryside. Lafayette um, is not able to, maybe it's due to some laws, you couldn't, you couldn't take a horse from someone unless you were within 20 miles of a battle or within 50, oh, right. something like this. He was, he was basically limited and he was really petitioning to the government to allow him a little more flexibility in trying to get these horses without which he had no way to see what Cornwallis was doing. Right, so uh, that's exactly right. So on one hand, the British had uh, a cavalry unit by the, name, by the name of the British Legion, which was led by Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton. And Tarleton had as, sometimes as many as 150 cavalrymen. Sometimes he mounted infantrymen on spare horses. At other times, he would mount one infantryman behind a trooper to be able to bring more firepower with him. Um, there was also a small contingent of the 17th Light Dragoons, which was another British cavalry unit. Um, so the area in Virginia with sandy roads and mostly flat terrain between, between Richmond and Charlottesville and up to Fredericksburg was perfect for, for horses, um, and the British had them. The Americans really never had more than about 40 cavalrymen at a time, mm -hmm. and they had to be able to scout where the British were going, uh, what roads they were on, how many British soldiers were around, what Cornwallis's intentions were. They also had to be messengers. Um, part of the reason is the British were able to ship over saddles and horseshoes and bridles and bits and tack and blankets and cavalry sabers and horse pistols and holsters and dragoon swords and all that equipment could, would, could come over. When you read Jefferson's correspondence with various um, logistic, logistical bases in Virginia, officers, supply officers, the Americans had a terrible time being able to just mount 50 to 100 dragoons with the proper, what they called back then, furniture. And the furniture was all that equipment I just mentioned. It was very hard to come by. Um, it was very difficult to repair. Horses had to be procured. And Lafayette, as you mentioned correctly, Lafayette tried many, many times 
to buy horses from Virginians, borrow them, hire them. And when he couldn't do that, he was authorized, as were all officers uh, in this campaign, to impress them. And impressment means to seize property the government needs for war making with a, in exchange for a certificate for what that horse or gun or wagon, especially wagons, was worth. And the Virginians figured out pretty early how to hide the horses in the woods so Lafayette's impressment and commissary officers couldn't find them. Um, one, at one point, Lafayette wrote, I think Virginians love their horses more than they do their liberty, meaning they'd rather keep their horses and have the British come around and maybe even lose the war than to take a probably worthless certificate from a Pennsylvania Continental officer for their prized horse. So that, that, was, that was a problem throughout the entire, entire campaign. Interesting. So let's just say we're in June and July. Uh, in the book, there are several maps and I'll, I'll try to, to find the right map here to share. But so basically Lafayette is running a, a mouse game from the cat Cornwallis. He's basically just biding time for his reinforcements to come, is that? He wants his reinforcements to come. So with Cornwallis at Petersburg and Lafayette in Richmond, and um, incidentally, he did spend quite a number of days at his headquarters at Wilton, the original site of Wilton, which uh, was a 2000 acre Randolph property. Uh, most Richmonders know that Wilton has been removed to the, to the near West End. Um, but that property, that, that plantation was where the 895 bridge goes across the James, on the east side of the James River there. And um, Cornwallis decided he wasn't going to cross at Richmond, where the Americans had some pretty good positions. So he moved east and crossed the James River from the south side to Westover Plantation. And that's where they crossed. Uh, it took them about two days to cross. The men crossed in boats and they swam the horses across the river. So at that point, Cornwallis sent a detachment back to Portsmouth that I mentioned to, to reinforce the garrison there. Now, picture yourself as Lafayette. You've got about a thousand men. Some militia from Virginia counties is coming in, some going out. He never knew how many he was going to have until he woke up in the morning and saw the militia formations. But Cornwallis was now on the same side of the river as Lafayette. And Lafayette always wanted to have a physical barrier between himself and the British, if possible. And in Piedmont, in Piedmont Virginia, it's not really mountains and escarpments and strings of fortifications, it's the rivers going mostly west to east. So once, once and as this campaign unfolds, Lafayette was, was very careful to always get on the opposite side of the river from Cornwallis and the British. And that's the James River, the, the uh, North Anna, the uh, Mattapanai, the Rapidan, almost, almost all the way to Charlottesville. So Lafayette kept backing up as Cornwallis kept going north. Initially, Cornwallis was going to Fredericksburg. That's where the, uh, there were two main arms and equipment manufactories there. One was called Hunter's Iron Works. That was in Falmouth, right across the river from Fredericksburg. The other, the other depot there was called the Rappahannock Forge that was operated and run by, the, by Virginia. And they made swords, kettles, equipment, um, some weapons, uh, horse uh, cavalry furniture. So that's where it looked like Cornwallis was heading. And so Lafayette was backing up 
uh, keeping a river between him and Cornwallis, and look again, looking over his shoulder toward um, to see where Anthony Wayne was coming down from. So Lafayette's route can be traced, and I do that in the book, and Cornwallis's route can be traced too. Cornwallis um, basically started to go over to the York River and its tributaries, the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey, and raided tobacco warehouses um, in the Mechanicsville area, Aylet, Hanover Town, uh, Newcastle, which has disappeared, uh, heading toward Hanover Courthouse. And Lafayette, of course, kept backing up from the north and then to the northwest. So his route was more where um, uh, the Chickahominy River is. Uh, if folks might know where Rockville is in western Henrico County and up, up towards Spotsylvania, that area, um, to avoid Cornwallis. So that's kind of where they started chasing each other. So Lafayette, again, had not been reinforced. His forces were much smaller than Cornwallis's. He decided, well, prudence would be the best action here, and even wrote to Washington once that his, sm his force is too small even to get beaten, meaning that he couldn't even engage Cornwallis because his, his force was so small. So he eventually crossed the Rapidan. My research indicates that they probably crossed at Ely's Ford. It's north of where the Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center is um, on the river. So once Lafayette got that far north and Cornwallis is at Hanover Courthouse, by doing that, Lafayette, to use an 18th century ter uh, term, uncovered or left unprotected a lot of the Western t uh, uh, counties. So once Cornwallis had, had kind of chased Lafayette that far north, instead of going on to Fredericksburg, he turned west and made a three-prong assault or a raid on Charlottesville, Point of Fork, uh, and other depots. Uh, there was another depot out near uh, Scottsville at what, what used to be called Old Albemarle Courthouse. And uh, that's where Tarleton's raid came in. That's where Cornwallis went all the way out toward Goochland and, and uh, destroyed one of Jefferson's properties there called uh, Elk Hill and destroy quite a bit of property. So here's something that, that comes out of the book and uh, a lot of people commented on it was how ruthless Cornwallis was. So when he would go to say Elk Hill or other places, can we get a little idea of what they would do to a farm or to the people at a place when they came raiding through? Sure quite afraid of those, of the British troops coming through. Yeah. 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 Well, there's some evidence that we have that's very good. Uh, one is of, of, of Cornwallis and the British destruction of the Virginia countryside, especially between Hanover Courthouse and Charlottesville, which would be uh, Hanover, Louisa, Fluvanna, Albemarle, and Goochland counties, uh, and parts of Henrico also. So uh, one of the sources is the diary of, uh, uh, called the Honeyman Diary. And uh, Honeyman was a pastor that was staying at a plantation near roughly, near Patrick Henry Scotchtown and, Squ and Ground Squirrel Bridge uh, in that area in Western uh, Hanover. And he noted that when the, you know, after the British left a plantation that they had camped at overnight. Picture 5,000 men, hundreds of runaway slaves that were with them, trying to find things to eat and wood to burn uh, for fires. And they captured all the cattle and basically slaughtered the cattle for enough food, but left all the, all the entrails and, and bones and stuff uh, all spread out over this plantation. They had cut down the orchards and burned the barns for firewood and, and let the, turned the uh, horses loose into the fields for forage. 
We also have Jefferson's uh, post-war, actually he might have written it in 1782, I'd have to check that, but he made a claim with the state of Virginia for losses when the British stayed at, at his Elk Hill property um, for about six days, five or six days. And that property is, is between, it was close to the little town called Columbia near, near Point of Fork on Route 6, a modern Route 6. And he claimed how many uh, cattle he lost, how many slaves ran away with the British and that. And he mentioned uh, specifically in a letter that the horses that the British could not use to pull their wagons and artillery they cut their throats uh, and killed them so that the uh, militia and patriots and Continentals would not be able to use them. And so the other way, as I just alluded to, that we know about not only what the damages were, but Cornwallis's route was that Virginia allowed people, the, the, the um, state assembly allowed people to submit claims for losses during the raid. And all of those, well, I shouldn't say all, Many, many of those petitions are in the Library of Virginia. And you can see the originals, and they show what people lost, and slaves gone, and, and uh, cattle gone, sheep gone. But if you, if you plot out where those people lived, then you can see the route of the British Army from Columbia back toward Richmond and Williamsburg. I see. So we do have a good bit of evidence about that. So here's a question. So the the British troops as they roll through, are they actually freeing enslaved people or are is it an opportunity for enslaved people to run away? What was the fate of any of those enslaved workers? Did they go to the British side and what was, what was their ultimate fate? A lot of them ran away because they, they uh, associated the British with freedom. And they also were able to labor in the camps. Some acted as uh, cattle drivers, others as, as servants for officers and even sergeants. Um, it's difficult to tell how many ran away with the British during this campaign. I would say it was in the hundreds, to, uh, the hundreds of, of uh, freedmen who freed themselves. They basically got, a lot of them got abandoned at Yorktown. They suffered a lot from disease, uh, maltreatment, um, but a lot of them, once the British surrendered, they, they basically were abandoned by the British at that point. So we're, we're basically eventually moving east. Right. And when, then they get to Spencer's Ordinary, Green right. Spring. So uh, General Wayne and the Pennsylvania troops were able to uh, meet up with Lafayette in Orange County, uh, below the uh, south of the village of Orange Courthouse, by June 10th, and Wayne's troops came from York, Pennsylvania, to Frederick, Maryland. They crossed the Potomac at what's called Nolan's Ferry, uh, and went came by way of uh, Leesburg, modern Haymarket, um, a small town in Fauquier County. Uh, called um, Greenwich, Auburn, Casanova, and uh, across the uh, Rappahannock at um, near what's called Remington today, and uh, finally linked up with, with Lafayette in June. So once he had been reinforced, Lafayette quit, quit retreating from Cornwallis and moved to a position in Albemarle County, uh, in, near uh, Boyd's Tavern, along Meechunk Creek. And the, the, it was a blocking position on the Three Chopped Road, where the Three Chopped Road crossed the creek at a tavern called Allegree's Tavern. And once he had about 2,000 Continentals, several hundred militia, Cornwallis and Tarleton said, okay, we've, we've done enough out here. We're getting a little too far away from our base of supplies, which would be the James River, and decided to move back toward Richmond along the River Road. 
uh, on the north side of the James River. Interestingly, the, the location of the bridge uh, where the uh, Lafayette's Continentals uh, took up a position, um, Meechunk Creek and Allegree's Tavern can all be found uh, just off of US 250 between Pantops Mountain and Boyd's Tavern. So at that point, that's where, that's where the, the British stopped being on the offensive and started moving back toward Richmond and eventually uh, they were heading for Portsmouth, which was their, which was their plan. Um, so by that time, up north, it's probably much more details than we can get into, but Washington had begun to plan with the French under Rochambeau and realized that the French Navy was going to have some availability to um, augment American uh, forces uh, on the east, on the coast, uh, bringing ships and more soldiers up from uh, what's now Haiti and, and uh, Dominican Republic. And so Washington and Rochambeau and all their troops began to began to converge in the Williamsburg area by mid-September. And Lafayette was then again under Washington's command. And that's kind of where his independent command ends is when Cornwallis takes up a post at Yorktown. Washington and the French come, they besiege him. And I won't give away the ending, but uh, it was pretty happy for the Americans, let's put it that way. Yeah, it really is uh, true what they say, timing is everything mm -hmm. in this case. Um, it was interesting that um, when we were talking about communication before, you know, Washington's up here not exactly knowing what's happening, as is Clinton and then Cornwallis and all of these things. Meanwhile, they get word that there's gonna be some extra troops, uh, sorry, extra uh, ships available mm -hmm. coming up from the, the West Indies, and they're only available until October, so you right. better make hay while the sun shines. And, and they did. <laughs> that's precisely what happened. Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, so that's sort of, that's sort of, uh, as you said, we, we know the ending at, um, at Yorktown, but right. this, is, this, um, this book really is fascinating to, to read through what's going on everywhere. Um, I'll, I'll hold it up here. Um, this is a, a favorite in our gift shop, so that is precisely yes. why I was um, so happy to contact Dr. Moss today to talk about this book. Um, lastly, I guess, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Lafayette as a personality, as a man? Anything fun to know about the Marquis? Well, he was very young, uh, unusually young. Um, and that's and that may be, I've never really seen an analysis of this, but remember George Washington started his military career when he was 21 years old as commander of the Virginia Regiment in the French and Indian War. So he might have seen something in Lafayette that he saw from the French and Indian War times 20 years earlier. But Lafayette was one of these uh, enthusiastic, you know, glass half full types who was an aristocrat, incredibly wealthy, um, which of course Washington and the other Continental Congress members recognized that it never hurts to have a guest general who has an enormous amount of wealth that could contribute to your cause and get other friends back in France to do the same thing. But Lafayette served without pay uh, for a long time uh, he had been commissioned in France by American agents as a major general, which usually means commanding a division, shows up at Washington's headquarters, and there's no division for him. Uh, there's lots of other French officers, and there's lots of other American officers. So he agrees to serve as a, uh, as a volunteer, as a major general, commissioned with no command. And he, he would lead detachments for Washington and that he was wounded at uh, the Battle of Brandywine near Philadelphia in 1777. Uh, one interesting thing though that crops up all the time is that a lot of other officers writing to him during the war, such as Nathaniel Green, I believe Anthony Wayne, 
uh, Alexander Hamilton, they warn him, don't let your love of glory cloud your judgment and make you do something irrational in the field. So he seems to have taken that to heart by not trying to attack Cornwallis in central Virginia. Uh, he played his cards very well. And it was a, you know, it was a very, very near thing uh, that the British almost caught Lafayette a few times during the Piedmont campaign. But he seemed to need to have this glory and to prove himself. His father, who died when Lafayette was two, was a French general in the Seven Years' War and died in combat uh, at the Battle of Minden in 1759. So that might have influenced Lafayette as well. Did he go anywhere in Richmond, like locations that we might know today? I know you said he was that his troops in the beginning of that that spring summer were stretched from Rockets Landing to the Capitol. You know, did he pop by St. John's Church or anything like that? It is very possible he did. Um, any kind of a structure like that would have been used for some military purposes or the or the uh, the government. So you'll remember that um, by May, the government decided that discretion is the better part of valor. And with the British in Petersburg, they relocated to Charlottesville. So it's very, and, and that would have been in probably roughly May 10th, 11th, something like that. Um, Cornwallis crossed the James on May 24th or 25th. So that's when Lafayette and most of the Americans started bugging out of, of um, Richmond. But up until that time, there was no, you know, Jeffersonian Capitol building built by that time. The Capitol was a wooden structure. There would have been taverns, a lot of tobacco warehouses. Um, uh, so St. John's Church would have been a very uh, significant uh, structure that would have been used at the time, not to mention it sits on a hill, which um, is a great vantage point to see where the British are trying to cross the river and what have you. So he spent from basically probably the fourth week in April to about the fourth week in May in Richmond and the, the Richmond area. Wow. So, okay, we'll have to do some research and see if we can prove that, right? I would say it's it would be it would be in 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 Lafayette's published correspondence during the war, which was compiled sometime in the eighties, four volumes, and volume four is the one that covers this campaign. They have all they have all of his letters that are in existence or transcribed and put in order. And so if one looks at the heading from where the letters were written, um, that's where I traced a lot of his route. Um, there's also the famous immediate post-war map done by French topographical engineers that shows his route, um, Cornwallis's route and Lafayette, Lafayette's route from Petersburg all the way up to Fredericksburg, Charlottesville, back down to Portsmouth, Suffolk, and coming in and out of Richmond. That's really cool. Well, yeah, I think for me, I, we have just had a really fascinating talk with Dr. John Moss and, yeah. and uh, this amazing book. I hope um, people will know where to get it. I'm sure it's on Amazon, but you can also get it on the History Press. But here is a quote I actually like from the end of the book. So. After Jefferson was governor, it was Thomas Nelson who immediately followed him. Perhaps Governor Thomas Nelson's assessment of the Marquis is the most accurate, as he had ample opportunity to observe him in 1781. You could not have made the Virginians more happy in a commander than in the Marquis. He wrote to George Washington that summer, they have great confidence in his bravery and conduct, his regard for civil rights of the people, and his attention to the preservation of their property is very pleasing to them. In short, his character is held in the highest estimation by them. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a, a hero in Lafayette. 
here in Virginia in particular. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Moss, thank you so much for being with us. You're here welcome. Today. Glad to be here. Thank you. And yes, and why don't you hold up uh, your new book, your latest book about the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, which was where Con Cornwallis was right before he came up to Petersburg. There you go. It came out on March 2nd. Came out on March 2nd. Yep. And um, hopefully we'll see you at Historic St. John's Church okay, good. in person sometime in the future for one of your fascinating talks. And thank you again. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.